Hello there, this is Rio from Hamilton Education. I am the leader of our humanities department there at Hamilton. Today we will be looking at test 394, the first module and second module, um, doing a test review of every single question on the test. So if you missed any, you'll learn about it from me. Uh, let's start off with our first question here. We have, as always, the beginning of the test, starting with vocabulary, fill in the blank. Um, our goal is always to find a word that we would put in this blank prior to just plugging and playing each of these answer choices. How do we find a word that will fit? Well, we'll look at the rest of the passage for either context in the fo for context in the form of either a definition, a synonym or an antonym to figure out what word we want to have in that underlined fill in the blank portion. So research conducted by a planetary scientist suggests that the moon's surface may not accurately blank early impact events. When the moon was still forming, its surface was softer an asteroid or meteor meteor impacts would have left less of an impression. Thus, evidence of the early impacts may no longer be present. Okay, so what kind of word might we want to put in that underlined portion? Something along the lines of may not accurately demonstrate or show early impact events. Um, so reflect does not only mean... Um, Reflection in the form of a uh, like a like a mirror or something like that. Reflect can also be mean demonstrate. So that's exactly the kind of word that we're looking for. Let's find what's wrong with these other ones. Receive um, doesn't really fit here on the basis that um the current surface can't receive any early impacts anymore. That, that must have happened more before today. Evaluate is something that people would do. So while we may not be able to accurately evaluate early impact events, the moon's surface definitely would not be able to, right? So we can do evaluating, people can do evaluating, but a moon surface cannot. And then finally, mimic means to copy. It doesn't mean to show... So if you're missing a word like this, you might be thinking of reflect in only one definition of the word. Uh, but we want to think about the fact that sometimes secondary or tertiary definitions come up here. So that is why one is A. So for question two here, we have a vocabulary question, ultimately. Uh, fill in the blank. What will finish this sentence question? We always want to find our own word that we would maybe want to put in that underlined missing place. Why? If we just plug and play each of these answer choices, we're more likely to fall for a trap or distractor. Okay. So handedness, a preferential use of either the right or left hand, is typically easy to observe in humans. Because this trait is present, but less something, in many other animals, Animal-based researchers often employ tasks specifically designed to, to, re to reveal individual animals' preferences for a certain hand or paw. Okay, so this to me suggests, because we're looking for a definition or a synonym or whatever in the context, that it is harder to reveal in other animals than it is to reveal in humans. So we are going to look for something that means it is less noticeable, all right? So recognizable and noticeable are really good synonyms. That's what we're looking for. So I see A immediately as what I'm looking for. It matches the word I put in there for myself, noticeable. But let's also make sure that all of the other answer choices don't mean noticeable. So intriguing means interesting. It isn't less interesting in other animals. It isn't less intriguing. Significant means the importance of it. 
right? So while it is plausible that it is less significant, in this example, we're just talking about how can we determine handedness, right? How can we notice or identify handedness? Um, so significant is maybe true in another context, but not in the context of what this sentence means, okay? So if you're choosing significant and wrong, you want to make sure that you're really reading the whole passage. Exactly the same thing I would say for useful. That significant and useful, if you're choosing either of those, you're probably falling for the same mistake of not fully embedding yourself in the context. Okay, so for question three here on module one of 394, we have another fill in the blank vocabulary section. I want us finding language that we would put in that pink highlighted section rather than just plugging and playing all of the answer choices below. Why? If you just plug in each answer choice, you're likely to fall for a trap or a distractor. Um, the other thing I would like for us to do is to be deductive in our reasoning meaning getting rid of answer choices rather than just looking for the right answer choice. And finally, we want to be searching for a synonym, a definition, or an antonym somewhere in the broader context. So we need to read the whole thing, which you already have done. So it is by no means something to recognize the influence of Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch on Ali Banasader's paintings. Indeed, Banasader himself cites Bosch as an inspiration. Okay, so Bosch is an influence, all right? So we wouldn't want to say that he is not an influence. Anything that suggests that will be wrong. Um, however, some scholars have suggested that the ancient Mesopotamian poem Epic of Gilgamesh may have had a far greater impact on Banasadr's work. Okay, so it's saying that Hieronymus Bosch's influence is important, but maybe even less than the Epic of Gilgamesh. All right. So substantial, we can get rid of because it's not in the right place. If it said it is by no means something to recognize the substantial influence, if substantial was right here, that was where we needed to put it. I'd be happy, but it's in the wrong spot. So just because the word fits the context of the sentence doesn't mean it fits the context of just the underlying portion. Satisfying really doesn't quite fit here. It's by no means satisfying to recognize the influence. Um, I don't know why it wouldn't be satisfying. So, unimportant. We have kind of like the double negative almost, right, that you famously hear and are told to avoid. It is by no means unimportant. That means it is important. So it is important to recognize the influence of Bosch on Ali Banasadr's paintings is what it is by no means unimportant means. Okay, so it is important. Why? Because it says so. It says he says it's an important influence. Okay, so unimportant based on the logic of the sentence produces what we need. So if you're missing this, you might be struggling with the full context, noticing this no means here. And if you're selecting D appropriate, it's probably the same error. You probably didn't recognize this by no means here. Okay, so this is a classic tactic of the SAT on these vocab questions, putting qualifying words, qualifiers, right? Things which subtly change the meaning in sentences so that a word like appropriate, which would be sensible if it said, it is appropriate to recognize the influence is made wrong because of a word like no means, which turns a word like unimportant, the meaning of it to match the context. So watch out for qualifiers. Okay, so for question four, we have a question asking about the main purpose. This is a structure and purpose question. So. We don't want to get too esoteric, as they'll say, uh, with how we analyze or determine the main purpose of these SAT passages. Why? We're not in our English classes, right? We need to choose something that is irrefutable, not something that is only plausible. 
So this comes from 1912, which is important. We, we have to kind of be familiar with this kind of writing. Uh, 1912 short story out there. An elderly shop owner is looking at a picture that he recently acquired and hopes to sell. It did seem that the picture failed to fit in with the rest of the shop. A persuasive young fellow who claimed he was closing out his stock let the old man have it for what he called a song. It was only a little out of the way store, which subsisted chiefly on the framing of pictures. The old man looked at his views of the city, his pictures of cats and dogs, his flaming bits of landscape. Don't belong in here, he fumed. And yet the old man was secretly proud of his acquisition. There was a hidden dignity in his scowling as he shuffled about pondering the least ridiculous place for the picture. So we don't really know what the picture is, which is interesting, but we see, how would we describe this? A man buys a photo from a persuasive young man and the old man is a shop owner of pictures and he doesn't know if this picture quite fits, okay? So, something like A, is this super compelling in that, does it say something really deeply interesting about this passage? Say, I don't know, not really, if we're being honest. But that's not the perspective we want to take to our answer choices. We want to say, is there anything wrong here? Right? So, does the owner have conflicted feelings? Yes. He was secretly proud, but also doesn't seem like it fits. Right. Um, there's nothing wrong with A. Now, an answer choice like B. Is B plausible? This word resentment, right? To convey the shop owner's resentment of the person who got he got the new picture from. B is plausible, I guess, but is this enough to clarify that he resents the young fellow? No, not for the SAT. You could maybe write an English essay that suggests that and, you know, use other evidence from this probably longer passage to convey that. But on this test, if it doesn't say he had a certain frustration or resentment or what have you with that person in particular, it isn't enough. Um, okay, C, this part is right. Describe the items that the shop owner has. But most highly prizes, we don't have. So that's half right. And finally, D, to explain the differences between the new picture and other pictures in the shop. So we get the other pictures, but do we get the new picture described? No. Okay. So with questions like this, I want us being deductive. I want us getting rid of answer choices to arrive at the correct answer. There's something wrong with B, C, and D. There's nothing wrong with A. A is not the most interesting answer choice here. I would say that B is probably the most interesting, but that's not what we're being asked. We're being asked which choice best states the main purpose without being wrong. Okay, that's the secret of the SAT. You can't be wrong. So there's nothing wrong with A. We'll, we'll go with it. Okay, so for question five here, we have a question asking about the structure, okay? The structure of this passage. We're not being asked, what, the pa what does this poem mean? We're not being asked to analyze this poem or the goals or the rhetoric. We are just being asked, how is this poem structured? Okay, so let's read the poem. I hear it is charged against me that I seek to destroy institutions. But really, I'm neither for nor against institutions. What indeed have I in common with them? Or what with the destruction of them? Only I will establish in the Manhattan, which is Manhattan, and in every city of the states, inland and seaboard, and in the fields and woods, and above every keel, which is a ship, little or large, that dents the water, without edifices, or rules, or trustees, or any argument, the institution of the dear love of comrades. Okay, so I don't wanna think about too much about what this poem means. It's a gorgeous poem and it means something really awesome. But what do we have? We have a claim that other people make, okay? 
So this is a claim that other people make, a charge. And then him questioning that claim. Why? Well, here's his refutation of the claim. And this is his goals instead, right? So he says, they claim I want to destroy institutions. Uh, do I even care about either? No. But what I would like to do is create an institution of the dear love of Conrad. So this part, that kind of works, right? He kind of does summarize something of a worldview. But do we have an increasingly prevalent attitude Societal or anything else? No. Okay. B. Regrets his isolation from others. I don't see that anywhere here. C. The speaker concedes his personal shortcomings. Personal shortcomings. What would that be? You know, maybe being angry or maybe being too sentimental or something, right? We don't have that anywhere. Notice that we're going through seeing what is wrong with answer choices, not what is right with them, okay? We're looking to find what is wrong to get rid of them. So D, the speaker addresses a criticism leveled against him, then announces a grand ambition of him. So that word grand, yeah, the institution of a dear love of comrades in every single place is pretty grand. So that, nothing wrong with that. Addresses a criticism, yep. Then announces the ambition. Yep, what he wants to do. There is nothing wrong with D. That's how I want us getting to our correct answers. There is nothing wrong with this answer choice, but there is something wrong in every other answer choice. right? If you're missing this, you're probably focusing too much on what's good about other answer choices rather than focusing on what's bad in them or finding what is bad in them. Okay, so for six, we have another test structure and purpose question. It is important to note, this question is asking about the third sentence, okay? Only the third sentence. However, are you able to determine if a rubber tire is for a car or a bicycle or a tractor, if we're not considering the broader context that that tire would be part of? You can't, right? You need the whole picture in order to understand what a tire functions as or what anything functions for, right? So though we are focused on the third sentence, we need to be considering the whole context, okay? So we need to understand the whole thing. The, mo the mimosa tree evolved in East Asia where the beetle, I'm going to work on that, Trenis preys on its seeds, 1785 mimosa trees were introduced to North America, far from any of these beetles. But evolutionary links between predators and their prey can persist across centuries and continents. Around 2001, this beetle was introduced in southeastern North America, near where botanist Xu Meisheng and colleagues had been monitoring mimosa trees. Within a year, 93% of the trees had been attacked by the beetles. So, what is this text saying? Though these trees were introduced to America 200 plus years ago, just 20 years ago or so, the beetles were reintroduced or were introduced and re-attacked those trees. So even though it had been a long time and from far away, they knew how to attack, the beetles knew how to attract them, attack the mimosa tree. So I want to find things that we can get rid of. So it states the hypothesis that they set out to investigate, okay? No, it, this doesn't state a hypoth hypothesis. We can perhaps infer a hypothesis from this underlying portion, but it doesn't state, okay? This word state is the most important one here that's wrong, okay? Remember, we don't wanna make any inferences that go too far on these sort of questions. We wanna stay safe with our inferences. B, it, it presents a generalization that is exemplified, okay, so we get an example, by the discussion of the mimosa and beetle. All right, I don't see anything wrong with B right now. We do get an, a generalization, links persist, and it is exemplified. As you can see, links exist be, between predators and prey across centuries and continents. 
An example of this would be the mimosa tree and its beetle. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with B. C, it offers an, an alternative explanation for the findings. No, there is no alternate explanation presented here. And D, it provides continent context that clarifies why the species mentioned spread to the new locations. No, that's not talked about at all. So not only is there nothing wrong with B, there's something wrong with every other answer choice. That's the strategy by which we want to arrive to our answers on these questions. Okay, so for question seven here, we have a cross-text connections question. We have text one and text two, and we're gonna put them into dialogue. Interestingly, this 2021 book by David Graeber and David Wengro is very, very good. David Graeber just recently passed, and right before he passed, maybe right after he passed, this magnum opus book was released. Um, so we are being asked, how would they most likely respond to the conventional wisdom from text one? We don't need to infer much from to do this, okay? How they respond or how they would respond is basically going to be how they did respond. So let's find out, first things first, what is the conventional wisdom? So conventional wisdom long held that human social systems evolved in stages, beginning with small bands, with roughly equal status, and then the emergence of groups with hierarchical structures, okay? So we kind of have a sequential development of human social systems, starting with small egalitarian bands that eventually turns into things like we have today. However, anthropologists in a 2021 book, David Graeber and David Wengro, maintains that they have always been socially flexible, alternately forming systems based on hierarchy and collective ones with decentralized leadership. Okay, so it's always moving back and forth. The authors point to evidence that as far back as 50,000 years ago, some hunter-gatherers adjusted their social structures seasonally. At times, they looked like what they had before, or the conventional view at times, they had small egalitarian bands, but then they also sometimes came into large communities that had hierarchy. So how would they respond to the, to the conventional view that it all developed in one direction, starting from egalitarian to our current form? They would probably say, well, history points to evidence points to the fact that that's not the case. We've always had some element of both. It's not linear. All right, so let's look at A, see if there's anything wrong with it. By conceding the importance of hierarchical systems, but asserting the greater significance of decentralized collective societies. Okay, they're not talking about which one is better or worse at any point. They're just saying that simply evidence suggests it exists in a nonlinear fashion. B, disputing the idea that developments in social structures have followed a linear progression through distinct stages. Ah, there's nothing, that's exactly what they already do say. Now, we just don't get the disputing point in this second passage, but everything there is good, right? Developments in social structures are not linear. They don't go through distinct stages. They're flexible, alternating since as far as 50,000 years ago. Um, C, acknowledging that hierarchical roles likely weren't a part of social systems before the rise of agriculture. So one, they don't discuss that. And secondly, esteemed individuals and hierarchy are being kind of used semi-synonymously. So they were part. And finally, by challenging the assumption that groupings of human ga hunter-gatherers were among the earliest forms of social structure. Okay. I like this word challenging, and I like this word assumption, but hunter-gatherers were not the social structure that they said didn't exist, right? They're not out here saying that hunter-gatherers were not an early social structure. They were. We have hunter-gatherers right here, right? So that makes D wrong. There's So we found things that are wrong in A, C, and D. 
that we found that B pretty accurately describes their claims. So therefore, we are going with B. Okay, so for question eight, we have a poem that we are going to be asked about. But notice we have this language based on the text, okay? When we're being asked a question that's based on the text, we're being asked a detail question. We need to remember that on the SAT, we are not going to de deviate too far from the text. We're not going to make any big, bold inferences or assumptions, okay? So, what way is the human mind like a flower? Well, he'll probably say how it is like a flower. So the following is from Ezra Pound's poem, Hymn 3, based on the work of Marcantonio Flaminio. As a fragile and lovely flower unfolds its gleaming foliage on the breast of the fostering earth, if the dew and the rain draw it forth, so doth my tender mind flourish if it be fed with the sweet dew of the fostering spirit. Lacking this, it beginneth straightway to languish, even as a floweret or a little flower born upon dry earth, if the dew and rain tend it not. So what is this comparison? He is saying that the brain, like flowers, needs nourishment in order to grow and flourish. And while the flower needs rain and dew, the brain needs spirit. Okay? So, A, it can become increasingly vigorous, maybe, but it isn't the passage of time, right? It's having proper nourishment to flourish. Okay? This is passage of time here, right? If it's But if it's born on a dry earth, it won't ever flourish. It'll languish. Languish is the opposite of flourish, right? Struggle. B, it draws strength from changes in the weather. Okay, what does that mean, changes in the weather? No, it needs something consistent, rain and dew. C, it requires proper nourishment in order to thrive. Okay, beautiful. That's exactly what we need. It must be fed. Fed and nourishment are the same thing. So nourishment is working somewhat metaphorically here, right? Um, nourishment is, you know, usually like calories and vitamins and things, but you need the nourishment of the fostering spirit, according to Ezra Pound, for the brain to grow in the same way that the nourishment of rain and dew provide flower flourishing. D, it, provide, it preserves, perseveres despite challenging circumstances. No. If there are challenging circumstances like dry earth or a lack of the fostering spirit, it's going to languish. Okay. So, um, D or any of these other answer choices will come from you placing your own reading or your own assumptions of things about the brain or what have you into this poem. You might be one of those people who watches all these you know, silly little guys on, in you know, like TikTok or YouTube or podcasts or whatever that are like, we can only get strong if we face challenging circumstances or something. And you might believe that about the brain or, you know, the, the mind. But does Ezra Pound say it? Who's likely smarter than you? No. Right. So um, we need to go by the text in these. Okay. Okay, so question nine here comes from Jack London's Call of the Wild, classic book you all probably should have read in middle school at some point. We're focused on the main idea here, all right? So when we're determining the main idea, we want to see if there's any claims, anything like that. We don't want to stray from the text, though. We don't want to make a bold main idea claim that we know might be from this book because we read this book, right? You don't want to fall for what they call a baggage distractor. Um we also don't want to make any broad claims that go too far because we're looking to impress our English teacher with an interesting claim, right? The SAT wants us making safe inferences that are based on the text that are completely irrefutable, right? There's nothing wrong with them is our goal. So question nine, Thornton alone held Buck. Okay, so Buck is a sled dog who lives with John Thornton in Canada. Thornton alone held Buck. The rest of mankind was as nothing. 
Chance travelers might raise or pet him, but he was cold under it all. And from a too demonstrative man, he would simply get up and walk away. When Thornton's partners, Hans and Pete, arrived on the long-expected raft, raft, Buck refused to notice them till he learned they were close to Thornton. After that, he tolerated them in a passive sort of way, accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting. Right? It's a really good characterization of a dog right there, let's be honest. Um, so which states the main idea? Okay, so Buck has become less social since he began living with Thornton. All right, this part, you know, is he not very social? Yeah, he's not very social, right? Mankind in, in a mankind sort of sense. But are we getting anything before he was living with Thornton in this portion of the text? No. Okay. Now, if you read this book, you might have known that that's actually true of the book, right? Um, but we don't want to fall for a baggage distractor. B. Buck mistrusts humans and does his best to avoid them. Okay. Humans includes John Thornton right? Who Buck trusts. Also, he learns to trust Hans and Pete because they're friends with Thornton, right? So finally, does his best to avoid them. We're not seeing that because he is not avoiding several of them. Buck has been especially well-liked by most of Thornton's friends, all right? Tolerated is very different from well-liked. Um, so we can get rid of that. So there's something wrong with A, B, and C. Let's see if there's anything wrong with D. Buck holds Thornton in higher regard than any other person. Perfect. Okay. Nothing wrong with D. He likes Thornton and he likes certain people because they like Thornton. But other than that, you know, Thornton is his whole connection to people and the only person he really cares about. So therefore, we have D. Okay, so for question 10, we have a command of evidence question, quantitative. So we have a graph, which we want to make sense of a little bit, and then a text, and we're going to put those together. So as we can see in the graph, it's determining states with the greatest number of organic farms at a certain point in time. California's biggest, then Wisconsin, New York, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Washington. California's gigantic. Shout out Wisconsin. Um, okay, now let's read the text. Organic farming is a method of growing food that tries to reduce environmental harm by using natural forms of pest control and avoiding fertilizers made with synthetic materials. Organic farms are still a small fraction of the total farms in the United States, but they have be been becoming more popular. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in 2016, California had between 2,600 and 2,800 organic farms, and some other state had some other quantity. Okay, so this one's really easy in that you are not really being asked to interpret any information in the text or make any comparisons. We're just simply identifying information in the graph and putting it down there. So let's see which ones are right. Washington had between 600 and 800 farms. Okay, so here's the 600 mark. Washington is above 600, below 800. Nothing wrong with A. Okay, that check mark's a little big. Um, nothing wrong with A. B, New York had fewer than 800 farms organic. Well, 800's right here, and New York is above it. So, ah, something wrong with B. C, Wisconsin and Iowa each had between 1,200 and 1,400. Okay, Wisconsin has over 1,200, but Iowa doesn't. So, the Iowa part is wrong. Shout out Wisconsin, though. And finally, Pennsylvania had more than 1,200. 1,200 is right here. Pennsylvania is below it. Okay, if you're missing a question like this, you are just simply moving too fast. We have plenty of time on this digital SAT. It's rare that we run out of time. If you're missing a question like this, you need to slow down a little bit for a question like this. Make sure you're just being methodical and rudimentary because there's really nothing about this question that's complicated, but it is 
easy to make a mistake if you're going too quick. Okay, so for question 11 here, we have another command of evidence question, but now we are just focusing on textual, okay? So we need to find information that would directly support Gomez, Bahaman, and her team's hypothesis, okay? So obviously the most important part of this text that we're going to have to identify is their hypothesis, okay? So <clears throat> biologist Valentina Gomez Bauman and her team have investigated two subspecies of the fork-tailed flycatcher bird that live in the same region in Colombia. The one subspecies migrates south for part of the year and the other doesn't. Okay, so they're the same species, but different subspecies. One migrates south. The researchers found that due to slight differences in feather shape, the feathers of the migratory fork-tailed flycatcher, males, make a sound during flight that is higher pitched than that made by feathers of non-migratory males. The researchers hypothesize, okay, we know that this is where we're looking now. They hypothesize that the fork-tailed females are attracted to the specific sound made by males of their own subspecies. And over time, the female's preference will drive further genetic and anatomical differences between the subspecies. All right, so the subspecies that is migratory, the females prefer hearing that high-pitched sound, and those that are not migratory prefer hearing the lower-pitched sound. So we want to find some sort of information that confirms this hypothesis. All right, so A, the feathers located on the wings of the migratory flycatchers have a narrower shape, which allows them to fly long distances. All right, this is a very compelling answer to some other question that isn't being asked on this question, okay? This is information that would be very interesting in the context of this passage. But is this team considering the anatomical function of these, you know, feather types with regard to flight patterns or anything like that? No, they are just focused on the behavioral mating patterns that result from these anatomical differences. Okay, so it's plausible, but irrelevant, right? For B, over several generations, the sound made by the feathers of migratory male fork-tailed flycatchers grows progressively higher pitched relative to those made by feathers of non-migratory males. All right, that's exactly what we're looking for. What we wanna see is that as time goes on, the differences diverge because of ultimately female preference, all right? So that's exactly what we're looking for. Nothing wrong with that. Let's see what's wrong with C and D, if anything. Fork-tailed flycatchers communicate different messages to each other depending on whether their feathers create high-pitched or low-pitched sounds. What does this have to do with, you know, the, the development of diff further genetic and anatomical divergence, right? That, that has, it's, it's, again, potentially true, possibly true, but it's irrelevant to the question and irrelevant to the research hypothesis. And finally, D, the breeding habits of the migratory and non-migratory fork-tailed flycatchers remain generally the same over several generations. Okay, this one is probably actually an opposite distractor. Although the team is focusing on genetic and anatomical divergence between the subspecies, and this is a behavioral or you know habit difference between the subspecies, um, we want to see them diverging further. So it's both irrelevant and kind of opposite. So the only one that has nothing wrong with it is B, and that's why we go with it. Okay, so for question 12 here, we have another command of evidence question, this time quantitative. We are looking to identify, if we read the whole thing, something that finishes the example given. So um, when we read the passage, we see that there are four different types of this, there are four different sources for cosmic dust, SPCs, ASTs, HTCs, and OCCs. Um, we hear that there is a process called ablation, and ablation is the vaporizing of the dust material as it enters the atmosphere. And the faster the particles move, the higher the rate of ablation. So astrophysicist 
Juan Diego Carrillo Sanchez led a team that evaluated, that calculated average ablation rates for elements in the dust and showed that material in slower moving SPC or AST dust, okay, this is important, has a lower rate of ablation than the same material in faster moving HTC or OCC. For example, whereas the average ablation rate for iron from AST dust is 2.5%. Okay, so we're going to look at the, oops, didn't want that whole thing. As we see AST and iron is 28. That's a slower moving one. The average rate for, so we want to see iron. Okay, we can only compare iron to iron. So B and D are both going to be gone because I both of them talk about sodium. So we want to talk about the faster moving. Okay, so the faster moving are which two? So we have our slow moving, our pink, and our yellow is our faster moving. And we want to focus on just iron. So do we have an example which has OCC or HTC iron 90 or 98? We do with C, okay? A talks about the right parameter iron, but it talks about the wrong example. We want to show that faster moving, so HTC and OCC lead to higher ablation rate. C is the only one that does that. Okay, so for 13 here, we have a command of evidence question, which is also something of an inference question that is based off of a text, okay? So we've already read the text. What does the text say? Art collectives exist for the reasons of style or perhaps politics or perhaps cost mitigation. Regardless, collaboration is essential or typical of collectives. However, based on recent interviews, an arts journalist claims that this, can, that this collaboration can be difficult for artists who are often used to having sole control over their work. Okay? So, collaboration can be difficult in collectives for artists who are used to having sole control. So we want a quote that says, the collaboration is difficult because I'm used to doing my vision. All right? Let's see which interview says this idea. A, the first collective I joined including many, sorry, the first collective I joined included many amazingly talented artists. And we enjoyed each other's company. But because we had a hard time sharing credit and responsibility for our work, the collective didn't last. Okay, so I like this so far. I will say shared credit and responsibility for our work doesn't exactly connote to me the idea of sole control over their work. So let's see if there's anything better. B, we work together, but that doesn't mean that individual projects are equally the work of all of us. Many of our projects are prim primarily the responsibility of who originally proposed the work to the group. Okay, that's an opposite distractor. That's exactly someone saying, I'm used to having sole control and I basically do, it works, right? We want there to be a problem. Okay, which is, again, one of the reasons why we like this part up here. Didn't last shows that there's a problem or difficult. C, having worked as a member of a collective for several years, it is sometimes hard to recall what it was like to work alone without the collective support. But that support encourages my individual expression rather than limits it. Okay, this is an opposite distractor here, right? Everything up until that red part works. This part is fine, but that red part does not work. So we have to get rid of it, that last sentence. Finally, D, sometimes an artist from outside the collective will choose to collaborate with us on a project, but all of those projects fit within the larger theme of the work the collective does on its own. Okay, that's referring to a different part of the passage, right? The fact that they often sometimes work together for shared stylistic or other reasons. Um, so, Again, A is the one that has nothing wrong with it. I wish A was a little bit different if I was answering it myself, 
But again, we're not looking for what we think is perfect. We are looking for something that is irrefutable or that there's where there's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so for question 14 here, we have a command of evidence question based off of a quantitative information. Okay, so we have the effect of a certain type of fungi on three different species, and we are shown um, how big they grow when the soil includes the fungi and how big they grow when the soil doesn't include the fungi. All right, notice what makes them different. Corn and marigold host the fungi but broccoli doesn't, okay? So notice that broccoli, which is not a host, the average mass is basically the same, whether there is the fungi or not. However, with corn and marigold, the masses are very different when you introduce the fungi. So it seems like having a ho being a host, you, need, you want the fungi there because it's gonna really increase the amount or the mass that the soil grows. So now let's read the text. Mycorrhizal fungi in soil benefits many plants, substantially increasing the mass of some. A student conducted an experiment to illustrate this effect. The student chose three plant species for this experiment, including two that are mycorrhizal hosts, species known to benefit from the fungi, and one species and one non-mycorrhizal species or a species that doesn't benefit from and may even be harmed by mycorrhizal fungi. The student grew several plants from each species, both in soil containing the fungi and soil that had been treated to kill the fungi and other, to kill mycorrhizal and other fungi. After several weeks, the student measured the plant's average mass and was surprised to discover, okay, so we want a surprise, okay? So something that is unexpected, so what is expected? If you have mycorrhizal for the mycorrhizal hosts, you have more. And what's the other expectation? For non-mycorrhizal species, there would be no benefit or maybe even harm. Okay, so we're looking for an answer choice which says either no benefit to um, our other ones or the so we're looking to see either that the mycorrhizal hosts don't benefit or that a non-mycorrhizal species does benefit. However, when we look at the graph, we see that the mycorrhizal species do benefit and broccoli actually does increase a little bit, okay? So it's probably going to be something saying that broccoli got a little bit bigger. All right. Um, so B, we cannot compare the mycorrhizal host species to the non-mycorrhizal host species. Those are two categories we cannot compare. Um, C, that's what we expect. We expect to see a mycorrhizal host, like marigold, having a higher mass when there is mycorrhizal. Okay, that's what we were expecting. So C is true, but it isn't unexpected. B is true, but it isn't unexpected. And then D is comparing something that we can't know. We don't know whether marigolds and corn, whether corn is typically bigger than a marigold or not. So there's something wrong with B, C, and D. Now let's look at A. Let's see if A would be unexpected. So with broccoli, we are expecting when it's in the mycorrhizal fungi, it's going to grow equal or less. However, it grows slightly better. So that was a surprising discovery. Okay, so it seems like perhaps fungi but beneficial to my to broccoli. Um, no, it's not the best experiment design, right? Maybe it's some other fungi that is providing the benefit to broccoli. Um, but we definitely aren't seeing the mycorrhizal fungi causing them to struggle like we maybe would have expected based off of the student's hypothesis. Therefore, we have A. And with that, we end the reading portion of module one of 394. All right, so question 15 here, actually the final um, reading question. I thought 14 was our final reading question, but we had one more. Uh, for module one of test 394, 15, several artworks found among the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Pompeii depict a female figure fishing with a cupid nearby. 
Some scholars have asserted that the figure is the goddess Venus, since she is known to have been linked with cupids in Roman culture. Here's the important part. But, oops. But, University of Leicester, or how do you pronounce that? Archaeologist Carla Brain, she's probably smart with a name like that, suggests that cupids may have also been associated with fishing generally. The fact that a cupid is shown near the female feature, figure then, or therefore, so what we're looking for is something that says it could be for fishing or it could be Venus. We don't really know since they are both associated, according to Carla Brain. So it is not conclusive evidence that the figure is Venus. There is nothing wrong with this. Remember, our goal most often is to find something that has nothing wrong with it. Rather than looking for an answer that is has the best right portion of it, we're looking to see which answer choices have something wrong or nothing wrong, okay? So, is this a suggestion? No, right? So, Venus is linked with cupids, but cupids are linked with fishing, right? Um, that does not mean that Venus is linked with fishing, okay? Um, C, eliminates the possibility that the figure is Venus. Okay, eliminates is too far. It still could be Venus. It could be Venus. It could not be Venus. It could just be fishing and cupids, or it could be Venus and cupids and fishing. And then D would seem difficult to account for if the figure is not Venus. That doesn't make sense. What Carla Brain is saying is that the opposite of that. So A is the only one that has nothing wrong with it. Okay, so with 16, we have our first question of the writing portion on module one. Uh, here we have a question that's talking about um, pronouns, antecedents, and whether we have possessive or plural, okay? So literary agents estimate that more than half of all nonfiction books credited to a celebrity or other public figure are in fact written by ghostwriters. What are ghostwriters? Professional authors who are paid to write other people's books or other people's stories, but whose names never appear on book covers. Okay, so we have people's and stories. So we need to see, is stories going to be plural or possessive? Well, we know that, or both. We know that stories in this case is going to just be plural. So A and C are both plural, but B stories is singular possessive and D stories is singular possessive. Okay, so our issue now is whether people's Hat, we need to show possession with peoples or not, okay? So, people is plural as is. This is a big point of contention, okay? So, people is the plural form of person in this case. There are rare instances in which people can be singular and peoples would be plural. Maybe if you were talking about, um, you know, uh, the Kumeyaay were one of many indigenous peoples to inhabit California prior to colonization. Or the Kumeyaay were a nomadic people, okay? That's when people can be singular and peoples can be plural. But in most cases, almost all, people is the plural form of person, which is what we have here. When something is plural without an S, we show possession by adding an apostrophe S. When it's plural by adding an S, so a word like dogs, we add an apostrophe after the S. So if we're showing dogs in possession, it would be D-O-G-S apostrophe. But because people is already plural, without the need for an S, we would just do apostrophe S. So A gives us that. C, on the other hand, peoples is only the plural form of the wrong type of people, right? Um, not the plural form of person. And additionally, it isn't showing possession whatsoever. Why do we know that this needs to be possession? Well, we could say professional authors who are paid to write the stories of other people, right? If we can put it in that blank of blank format, it's usually possession, okay? So therefore we have A for 16.
Okay, so for 17, we have another punctuation question. We are being asked to identify a couple of things. Okay, so first things first, let's read it. After a spate of illnesses as a child, Wilma Rudolph was told she might never run, walk again. Defying all odds, Rudolph didn't just walk, she ran fast. During the 1960 Summer Olympics in Rome, she won both the 100 and 200 meter dashes and clinched first place for her team in the 4 by 100 meter relay, becoming the first U.S. woman to win three gold medals in a single Olympics. Okay, so this part, that part is what's clarifying our answer for here. Okay, what clarifies our answer choice? Meaning... We need to see that this whole portion is its own compound or complex sentence, and everything before it is another sentence, and what we have is an elaboration, okay? So notice that A, B, C, and D all have fast after a dash, okay? Using either a dash or a colon, we can create an elaboration, which sometimes is just a short little word tacked on to the end of a sentence to change the meaning. So she didn't just walk, she ran fast, okay? That is coming at the end of a sentence, all right? Therefore, it must end as a sentence, okay? A is wrong because it turns fast into a non-essential phrase. And it means that the sentence says, Rudolph didn't just walk, she ran fast during the Olympics in Rome, she won both, okay? If we do that, we do A, we create an error where this comma becomes a comma splice. The same happens with B. The same happens with C. Okay, that fast, because it is an elaboration, must come before the end of a clause. All right, it must come at the end, before the end of a, of, of a sentence, really. So what can we have? Only our period. Therefore, 17 is D. Okay, so for question 18, we have another punctuation question asking us to separate two independent clauses. So let's remember, what are our rules for separating two independent clauses? We can, one, use a period, just make them two separate sentences, totally fine, if they are both independent clauses. Secondly, we can use a comma and a fanboys, conjunction, right? So comma and a for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Or we can use simply a semicolon. The period and the semicolon are very similar, right? They both just end the clause with a piece of punctuation and then begin the next clause, both of them independent. So in this case, our first clause is an independent clause, uh, or our first sentence is a sentence, right? But then we look, in 2004, Watt sewed strips of blankets together to craft a 10 by 13 inch sampler. In 2014, she arranged folded blankets into two large stacks and then cast them in bronze creating two curving 18 foot tall blue bronze pillars, All right? Um, so we have a range of shapes and sizes, okay? So a 10 by 13 inch sampler is very small. A 18 foot tall pillar is very large or quilts, okay? Um, so you probably, if you got this wrong, you probably like a or D, but let's find out what's wrong with them. This word later is actually a really good transition. I would not mind if later was there. However, how later is being shown is wrong. We cannot connect two independent clauses with just a comma, okay? If we use just a comma, we are creating a comma splice. So in 20, 2004, Watt sewed strips of blankets together to craft a 10 by 13 inch sampler later, okay? Also, the comma is in the wrong spot. If it were to be a comma. What we would want really is a semicolon here and then a comma. With D, the same issue arises. If this was a semicolon, I would love this answer. However, it's not. We cannot connect two independent clauses with just a comma. It creates a comma splice. Finally, C makes the same error as A and D in creating a comma splice. So B is the only one that doesn't violate the rules of grammar. Okay, B does not maybe sound as good in terms of language, in terms of our ear, as D might. Later, in 2014, she arranged folded blankets, blah, 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 blah. That sounds good, but that isn't, that violates a rule, okay? We are concerned with the rule and the rules of punctuation and grammar on this test. 
we must end an independent clause and introduce the next independent clause with either a period, a semicolon, or a comma and a fanboys. And if we're not doing that, we're making a mistake. B is the only one that does that. B is the only one that doesn't make a mistake. Okay, 19 is a really tricky one. We have a punctuation question here on module one of 394 that's really tricky because it's not just punctuation at hand. We also have modifier placement. We really have everything coming up in this question. So let's read it all the way. African-American Percy Julian was a scientist and entrepreneur whose work helped people around the world to see. Named in 1999 as one of the greatest achievements by a U.S. chemist in the past 100 years, Julian, or something happened where Julian created a synthesis of an alkaloid, and that alkaloid led to the first mass-produced treatment for glaucoma, okay? So we are going to go by our rules and regulations of grammar to see which of these do not work. We want to find errors and get rid of those. That's what I'm most concerned with, okay? We want to be deductive, getting rid of things, rather than saying, oh, I like this part, let's roll with it, okay? So this part in A seems okay. Semicolon, it led to the first mass-produced treatment for glaucoma. That's an independent clause. And remember, we can start an independent clause with a semicolon. However, what is our main issue? Everything up until that semicolon is a dependent clause. Named in 1999 as one of the greatest achievements by U.S. chemists in the past 100 years, Julian synthesized the alkaloid fistogenine in 1935. It led to, okay... Here, we cannot do that because of this comma, okay? Um, B, we actually are creating the exact same issue. What we want to have here is a dependent clause followed by an independent clause, all right? So Julian's 1935 synthesis of the alkaloid, fistogamine, led to the first mass-produced treatment for glaucoma, glaucoma is the structure that we need where we're moving from a dependent to an independent using just a comma. We also want to make sure that we're not making it unclear what led to the first mass-produced thing. Julian led to the first mass-produced thing. What Julian did, Julian's synthesis, okay? So this is in the wrong spot. And then also this word and is creating an issue um, because it's suggesting, we, we, we just don't need to compound uh, or a coordinate conjunction there. So as a result, C is the only one that has nothing wrong with it. Okay, so 20 on module one of 394 is asking us to know a rule of semicolons or a role of semicolons that is less common than our typical understanding of semicolons. So typically when we think of semicolons, we think, ah, connect an independent clause to another independent clause, connecting those with a semicolon or a period or what have you. However, there is another role of semicolons, which is to separate items in a list if the items in that list need a comma. Okay, so what does this mean? We can sometimes have items in lists, famous, for example, cities and states, or when you list the city, then you list the state, you need a comma for each item in the list. Why then would it matter that we have semicolons between those? Well, we want to make sure we're not saying San Diego, California, Boston, Massachusetts, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Anchorage, Alaska, right? We don't want those to all seem as though San Diego and California are separate units in our list, right? We want San Diego, California to be its own unit. So how do we clarify that San Diego, California is a unit even though it has a comma in it? Well, instead of using commas to separate the items in the list, in this case, city states, cities and states, we use a semicolon. So we often teach this example with cities and states, but that's not the only time this example shows up. We also see it if items in a list need a comma for whatever reason. In this list, this, the comma that is needed is for the first item in the list. The first item in the list is um, what they're dedicated to. So they're dedicated to growing, to fostering, and educating. These are the things that they're dedicated to. So growing what? Growing plant species, both native and non-native. So there is a necessary comma in that first element in the list. 
you don't need a comma in every element in the list to need to separate them with semicolons. Imagine it was all commas. It would be really unclear. So why are we using the semicolons to separate the items in the list? Now, where must that semicolon come? At the end of the element. So what is the full element in this, this first element of the list? Growing diverse plant species, both native and non-native. That's the full element. So the semicolon must come at the end of the word non-native because that's the full element. As you can see, D uses just a comma, which we can't use. If the, if, you know, and, and we probably should be avoiding that because we see here, oh, there's a semicolon there. C uses a semicolon, which is nice, but it uses it in the wrong spot. A doesn't use a semicolon, and it suggests that both native and non-native is another element. B is the only one which uses our semicolon at the end of our first element before our second element. That's what we need. So therefore, B is the only one that is correct. Okay, so 21 here on module one is a great example or a great place to remind students that if you're missing this, I don't, you, you might be creating rules out of things which are never rules, all right? So on this question, I've had several students in my time tell me, well, when you have a transitional adverb like this word, however, right? However is our last word here. When you have a transitional adverb like however, we always want to start it with a semicolon. That is not a rule. That is not a rule, okay? That is very common. Very often, you will see a structure of a sentence where you have an independent clause, a semicolon, a transitional adverb, a comma, and then the next rest of the independent clause, another independent clause. You know, Rio wants us making a systematic approach to the writing section of the SAT, semicolon. However, comma, he does understand that intuition can lead to good results on occasion, right? That's what we oftentimes see. But that is not a rule. That is not the only way we can see a transitional adverb. We can also see a transitional adverb at the end of a first independent clause. We can see it embedded within an independent clause, a single independent clause. We can see it starting the first one, uh, starting a sentence, right? There are many different ways that we can see these transitions. So what you need to figure out is where does the clause shift? Where do we have two different clauses? So let's just read this real quick. Sociologist Okinaka sits on the review board tasked with adding new sites to the Hawaii Register of Historic Places, which includes Pailanahale, Heiu, and the Opeika Road Bridge. Okay, I don't know if I pronounced those right. Okinaka doesn't make such decisions single-handedly, however. All historic designations must be approved by a group of nine other experts from the field of architecture, archaeology, history, and Hawaiian culture. So we need to see, what is this, however, transitioning us between? Is it transitioning us between Okinaka does, so let's think of this, okay? However is a contrasting word, a pivot word. So we are either pivoting from Okinaka doesn't make such hand decisions single-handedly, and then, and, and bef so, okay, what are we pivoting? We are pivoting from the first sentence into this next clause. This, however, could have shown at the, shown up at the beginning of this second sentence. It could have shown up before the name Okinaka. Why? Because this suggests that he sits on the board. However, just that he sits on the board doesn't make he do, doesn't mean he does it alone. Okay? So, <clears throat> that means that this part of the clause, or this clause, this part of the sentence, all historical, is proof of the previous clause. We would not want to put however at the beginning of the second clause because that suggests that the second clause is pivoting away from the claim of the first clause of our second sentence. But the first clause of our second, second, second sentence and the second clause of our second sentence are in agreement. Therefore, the however must be contained within the first clause to show that the first clause is pivoting from our first sentence. Notice that this is a lot like math, right? This is logic. Here, we need to be thinking logically. So, which of our answer choices puts, however, in the first clause of our second sentence? Only A, all right? B, that looks conventional, but it is irrational. 
to suggest that the all historical stuff is a pivot away or refutes the first claim of the first clause in the second sentence. All right. However, embedded in C suggests that that whole second sentence is one clause, which it isn't. The same with D, which doesn't use any punctuation whatsoever. So the only one that doesn't create any mistakes is A. It is the only one where our pivot is in the proper clause, showing that clause one of sentence two is pivoting from the established idea of sentence one. Okay, so for 22 on module one of 394, we have a transition question. Well, for me, I do not want us just plugging in our transitions and seeing if they work to our mind. I want us thinking what kind of category, what kind of role is this transition providing, and then which word aligns with that category or role. So geoscientists have long considered Hawaii's Mauna Loa volcano to be the Earth's largest shield volcano by volume, measuring approximately 74,000 cubic kilometers. The next sentence says, According to a 2020 study by local geoscientist Michael Garcia, Hawaii's Huhahunu shield volcano is significantly larger, boasting a volume of around 148,000 cubic kilometer kilometers. Okay, so they are contrasting information. This information and this information is in contrast, right? It does not equal each other. So. Therefore, we need a word, a transition, which demonstrates contrast. Secondly, builds on the first, okay? Are we building on this first claim? No, we are refuting it. We are going against it. We are contrasting it. So we need something that shows that. Consequently shows as an evidence of, or as a consequence of. Is this larger volcano a consequence of the fact that many people thought the other volcano was bigger? No, no. Um, it's a consequence of something else entirely. Moreover, is giving additional supporting evidence to a previous claim. So if the previous claim was supported by the 148,000 cubic kilometers at work, but it isn't, it's refuting. So the only word that shows refutation is however. We were looking for a word like yet, however, nonetheless, right? Or however or yet is really our best here. However is very common. It shows contrast, and that's what we want. Okay, so for 23, we have another transitions question. And like I explained for 22 of this same module, one of 394, I want us thinking, what is the role of the transition word here? What are we demonstrating? We don't want to just plug in and play our words. We want to see what role do we want, and how do we demonstrate that role or category? So Samuel Coleridge Trailer was a prominent classical music composer from England who toured the U.S. three times in the early 1900s. The child of a West African father and an English mother, Coleridge Taylor emphasized his mixed race ancestry. For example, he referred to himself as Anglo-African. He also incorporated the sounds, so I'm adding that word also. Also, he incorporated the sounds of traditional African music into his classical music compositions. Why am I saying that? Because we are giving ourselves a claim, right? What is our claim? He emphasized his mixed race ancestry. Then we provide an example as shown by the transition. For example, he does this. Then we are provided with an additional example. Okay. By giving an example and providing an additional example, we are looking for a word that shows additional or also, okay? Pretty clearly, A is a, in addition, is fulfills our role of increasing, okay? Actually would be to say, many think this, but something else is the case, right? Actually brings us back to reality from something false. However, like actually is a pivot word, okay? Which is not what we want. And regardless is another, type of a pivot word. So all of the rest of these are actually of the same general role and category, and A is the only one that shows additional insight that we're looking for. Okay, so for 24, we have our final transition question of module one. Remember with transition questions, I do not want us just throwing our answers, choices into the underlined portion and seeing if they stick, seeing if they fit, 
right? I want us trying to figure out what is the relationship between the two things we're transitioning between and what kind of role or context or uh, category should the transition come from that we'd want to put in there. So in 2019, researcher Patricia, Patricia Curado Gonzalez and food historian Nawal Nasrallah prepared a stew from a 4,000-year-old recipe found on a Mesopotamian clay tablet. When they tasted the dish, known as hasrutum, or unwinding, they found it had a mild taste and inspired a sense of calm. The researchers, knowing that dishes were sometimes named after their intended effects, theorized that the dish's name, unwinding, referred to its function to help ancient diners relax. Okay? So, um, uh, so we, we are looking to say that this is a cause and effect relationship, right? They found a mild taste and a sense of calm related to the name unwinding, and thus, or as a consequence, the researchers theorized that the name unwinding referred to its function. Okay, so what word is synonymous to thus, which comes into this category? Therefore, okay. Alternately, suggest that there's a different explanation, right? An alternate explanation. An alternate jersey is a different jersey from the one that's typically worn. Nevertheless, though we use it often in kind of anything, is actually a pivot word. When we say nevertheless, we're saying regardless, right? Something along those lines. We're, we're looking to pivot to something new and kind of discount to some degree what came before. Likewise, is when we have, we're saying something is similar right? So-and-so is tall. Likewise, so-and-so is tall too, okay? Um, therefore, is the only one that has this kind of consequence effect building thing. If you're missing a question like this, you're probably going too fast, simply put. You have time on this test, make sure you're really seeing what should, what kind of word should I have here, and which of our answer choices looks close to that word. Okay, so with question 25 here, we have what we call the rhetorical synthesis or notes question. Okay, this is one of three on the first module here of test 394. Um, with these questions, unlike all the rest of my questions on the reading and writing, I want us looking at the question before reading the passage. That's rare. Why do we do that? Well, because we are not being asked to summarize or understand or best characterize the notes, we're basically being asked to discount superfluous or irrelevant information, right? The extra stuff that isn't relevant to the particular question. We are given a very specific parameter, the difference between baking soda and baking powder, right? That's all we need in our answer choice. Anything that doesn't have that in the answer choice is wrong, okay? And that's all we're looking for. So, Chemical leavening agents cause carbon dioxide to be released within a liquid batter, making the batter rise as it bakes. Baking soda and baking powder are both chemical leavening agents, okay? So we don't need that. In fact, we don't want that, right? That's what, how they're the same. How are they different? Baking soda is pure sodium bicarbonate. To produce carbon dioxide, baking soda needs to be mixed with liquid and an acidic ingredient such as honey. So baking soda is pure sodium bicarbonate, whereas baking powder is a mixture of sodium bicarbonate and an acid. To produce carbon dioxide, baking powder needs to be mixed with liquid, but not with an acidic ingredient. So baking soda, in fact, let me just do this so it's even clear. So what is the difference? So baking powder is sodium bicarbonate and an acid, and it needs with liquid, but not with acidic. And with carbon dioxide, or with baking soda, we need liquid and an acidic, okay? So, something about that, all right? To make batters rise, so let's look at our options and see which is exclusively talking about the parameters we need. To make batters rise, bakers use chemical leavening agents, such as baking soda and baking powder. While that is true, it isn't emphasizing a difference. Baking soda and baking powders are chemical leavening agents that, when mixed with other ingredients, cause carbon dioxide to be released within a batter. Again, that is true. But what are we missing? 
We are missing the difference, right? We only want to be focused on the difference. C, baking soda is a pure sodium bicarbonate and honey is a type of acidic ingredient. That is true, but is that showing us a difference between baking soda and baking powder? No. So everything else is wrong. So we're already are arriving at D, but let's see if D is correct too. To produce carbon dioxide within a liquid batter, baking soda needs to be mixed with an acidic ingredient, whereas baking powder does not. Okay, so there is the difference. That emphasizes the difference. If you're missing a question like this, you are either not focused enough on the question, you're more focused on what is relevant from these notes. The question tells us what is relevant. Okay, so you need to focus there, or you're just moving a little bit too quick. So for question 26, we have what we call rhetorical synthesis or notes question. In these questions, unlike every other question on the reading and writing section, I want us looking at the question first. I normally would like for us to read the passage first, but for these questions, we are being asked to exclude irrelevant extraneous information or superfluous information. So we want to find exactly what we need to focus on and find that, that to be the notes that we need. The rest of the notes are going to be interesting or what have you, but our, answer, our question is not asking us to describe the notes in general or give an interesting take on the notes or identify something that is true of the notes. It is only asking us to describe unwoven light to an audience unfamiliar with Sue Sunny Park. Okay, so we have two parameters here. We need to introduce Sue Sunny Park and we need to describe unwoven light. So let's look at these. Sue Sunny Park is a Korean American artist who uses light. Okay, there we go. That's the Sue Sunny Park part. Unwoven light is the name, and describing it is this. Okay, this is one of those rare ones where actually pretty much everything is relevant. This is very rare. So we want one which includes all of these. So a, Park's 2013 installation, Unwoven Light, features light as a premium me medium of expression, features a chain link fence. Okay, A, look at all this pink. It is literally all pink. Pink is really good here. It has all of the description of the thing as we need. But what's missing? Who Park is. We need to introduce who Sue Sunny Park is. B, Sue, uh, Korea, so, B, we have the yellow part, right? We have a good introduction to who Sue Sunny Park is. But what is missing? Any description of unwoven light. C, we have a little bit of the pink. But what's wrong? A name is not an introduction. So finally, D, we have Korean-American artist, Sue Sunny Park. Good. And, oh, whoops, I used the wrong color there. Not really all that important, but we have Korean-American artist, Sue Sunny Park. And we have Unwoven Light description. Therefore, we have both parameters. The rest only have one of our parameters. So thus, we must go with D. So question 27 here, the final question on the first module of 394. We are asked a rhetorical synthesis question. Rhetorical synthesis has a unique strategy that I don't recommend for really anything else on the reading and writing, but is really important for rhetorical synthesis. What is that strategy? To look at the questions first. So we're going to skip the passage and focus at just the question. Why? Because the question shows what parameters are actually relevant from our passage. So the student wants to present TAN's research. Okay, that's one parameter, TAN's research, to an audience unfamiliar with Anchor Watt. So what are our parameters going to need? We are going to need to introduce Anchor Watt, and we are going to need to present the research. Okay, so we need the pink and the yellow. So let's look at our notes and see what we have. 
First, Angkor Wat was built in the 1100s to honor the Hindu god Vishnu. And it has been a Buddhist temple since the 16th century. All right, so that is an introduction to Angkor Wat. We'll probably need something along the lines of Angkor Wat when it was built and what it serves as now in order to uh, introduce Angkor Wat to the audience unfamiliar with it. Now let's see what introduces or discusses Tan's research. Decorrelation stretch analysis is a novel digital imaging technique that enhances the contrast between colors in a photograph. Okay. Um, not really knowing whether that's his research. Archaeologist Noel Hidalgo Tan applied decorrelation stretch analysis to photographs he had taken of Ingrid Watts' plaster walls. Okay, now here we have some interesting stuff. And that this analysis revealed hundreds of images unknown. Okay, so decorrelation showed images unseen at Angkor Wat, which was a Hindu temple and now a Buddhist temple. Okay, so let's see which answers have both of our parameters rather than just one or the wrong ones. So A, tan photographed the walls and then applied decorrelation. Okay, that's all good, but what is missing? Here, I'm actually going to use our colors. Okay, so we got that. We got that. Okay, that's all good. But what are we missing? That is not enough introduction for someone unfamiliar with Anchor Wat. B. Decorrelation, stretch analysis, is a novel digital technique. Okay, this isn't even really pink. All right, this is just telling us what decorrelation is. It doesn't really tell us the research that Tan did. This is not telling us that it takes place at Anchor Watt. So D, B is just kind of wrong in general. C. Okay, here's the research. And then we get some introduction to Angkor Wat, okay? Now, I would be interested in seeing maybe a Cambodian temple that has been used by both Hindus and Buddhists or something like that. I'd like maybe a little more information there, but we have both of them revealed. So let's see if D is better. So build to, oh yeah, there's all the yellow, but what is missing? We don't have, Tan's research. We don't have tan at all. So we're missing tan in D. Therefore, C is our only answer choice, which includes both of our parameters. As such, we choose C for 27, and we end module one of our test 394. Okay, so now we're here on module two of our test 394, starting as always, the reading and writing with our vocab questions. So the question one, like any vocab question, my goal is for us to find a word that we think fits the underlined missing portion uh, rather than plugging and playing each of these words, seeing if they fit, okay? I don't want us using our answer choices as our guide to what word should be there. I want us to use our brains and the context to guide what kind of word we want there. So the fashion resale market in which consumers purchase secondhand clothing from stores and online sellers generated nearly 30 billion globally in 2019. You know, those Depop girlies, as they say, expecting to see continued growth. Some analysts have, I mean, this one's pretty clearly predicted, predicted that revenues will more than double by 2028. Okay, so we cannot produce something. We cannot produce revenues prior uh, the produce just doesn't really work. Denied does work. It sounds fine. So if you chose an answer choice like denied, it sounds okay. Ex except we see continued growth. We're expecting to see continued growth. So maybe you know a thing or two about the market and you're like, ah, oh, it's not going to double. I don't believe that. So I think that experts would disagree. However, based off of the context of just the passage, which is all we can work from, we have to get rid of denied. Worried has, again, too much of a connotation here, right? Worried that revenues will more than double requires someone who doesn't want to see the fashion 
resale market expand. We cannot presume that that is how these uh, analysts or what have you want to see that. So predicted is the only one that works in this context. If you're missing this, you got to slow down a little bit on these kind of questions because you're likely just falling for a trap where you didn't fully get the context and meaning of the passage as a whole, which you got to do with these. Okay, so for question two here on module two of 394, we have yet another vocab question. As always, these modules start off with a good bit of vocab questions. Um, we always want to make sure that we're not just taking the answer choices and plugging them in and see which one we like the sound of best. That is a guaranteed way to miss some of these questions, right? The words for these questions, especially these early ones, are not particularly difficult. It's not particularly difficult vocabulary, but if we're not finding the meaning and context of the passage, the paragraph passage, we are gonna run into some problems. So let's get the context. Artificially delivering biomolecules to plant cells is an important component of protecting plants from pathogens but it is difficult to transmit biomolecules through layers of the plant cell wall. Marquita del Carpio Landry and her colleagues have shown that it may be possible to, okay, something this problem by transmitting molecules through carbon nanotubes, which can cross cell walls. So they're talking about solving this problem, right? Surmounting it, getting around the problem. So we need an answer choice, which shows that they are getting past this problem. So is conceptualize a word which we see to be synonymous with getting past? No. Conceptualize means to make sense of or understand or put it in the brain, right? We can conceptualize, you know, what it might have been like to live before electricity by living by going camping for a little while. Neglect this problem is to ignore it or to, you know, not not spend enough time with it, right? Illustrate the problem would be to demonstrate it, to show it. None of these mean to solve. Overcome is exactly the kind of word we're looking for because overcome means to surmount, right? It means to get past or move beyond or overcome a problem. So how are they overcoming this problem? Well, what is the problem? The layers of the plant cell walls. They get past it, carbon nanotubes. Getting past and overcome, overcome are the synonyms we are looking for. Okay, so for question three here, we have a vocabulary question. We want to be finding what kind of word do we want to fit that underlined portion prior to looking at the answer choices, okay? I don't want us just plugging in our answer choices and seeing which one we like the sound of. That is a surefire way of falling for a trap, even if you know all the words. So this one in particular, we have Rydra Wong, the protagonist of Samuel Delaney's 1966 novel, Babel 17, is a poet, an occupation which, in Delaney's work, is not something. Nearly a dozen of the characters that populate his novels are poets or writers, okay? So we know a thing or two about grammar if we're taking this test and we're in any of our classes. We know that a colon tacking onto the end of the sentence is an elaboration. And elaborations describe what comes before the colon. So this elaborates on what comes before the colon. So we're looking for something to say normal, right? But in a classic twist of the SAT, if poets are normal, that means they are not weird, okay? The word not, this is a classic SAT thing for these vocabulary questions. They make these double negatives, right? It is not weird to be a poet. It is not different or unique to be a poet, okay? Meaning it is normal or typical, okay? So we want a word which suggests the opposite of normal to connote that it is normal, okay? A little complicated. If you're missing this question, this word not is so essential and you're probably moving too quickly and missing that. Okay, so not infallible means not cap not incapable, well, not capable of, they are not incapable of failing. Okay, infallible means someone who is not failing. So 
we don't have any kind of value judgment as to whether they fail or whatever. Atypical. If you're struggling with a word like atypical, remember that 90-10 rule that most of the time, 90% of the time, we're able to figure out a word using its roots and prefixes. So we know that A, coming before things, means against or opposite or non, right? So typical, we all know that typical means normal. A typical day in San Diego is kind of sunny. And atypical is when it goes against the norm because of the prefix A. So we are looking for someone to say that it is not, not normal. It is not weird, not unexpected, okay? Lucrative means making money, right? Something is lucrative if it makes money. And tedious is when something is tiresome, okay? Tedious tasks are like menial tasks, doing the same thing over and over and over again that kind of creates a drudgery, all right? So when something is tedious, it's like, you know, pulling weeds is tedious. It takes a long time. It's kind of boring, not very stimulating. So none of those other words work. And atypical or not atypical explains the, the situation of poets. If you're missing this, you're probably missing that word not. You're not seeing the definition coming after the colon. And the only reasons that would happen is if you're working a little too quickly. Okay, so for question four here, we have another vocab question. As always, I want us thinking about what word would work in that perp that pink highlighted section. I don't want us just taking our answer choices and plugging them in. That's how we fall for traps and fall for distractors. So we want to find a definition, find an antonym or a synonym or what have you in there. Be aware of... Uh, uh, you know, distractors, etc. So for a 2020 exhibition, photographer and neurobiologist Okinola Jayafus, something, a series of new images based on a series of alphabet posters from the 1970s known as the Black ABCs, which featured Black children from Chicago. Jayafus fo photographed the now adult models and layered the photos over magnified images of the model cells resulting in what he called micro and macro portraiture. So I'm looking for made. I'm looking for a synonym with made, okay? Right off the bat, created and made are very synonymous, okay? Validated means to approve, right? You need validation. You need to validate your ability to get into somewhere or what have you. So validating it, or of course, you know, you can make things valid. Oh, you're valid for that, is to approve or whatever. Validated doesn't work here. Challenged a series of new images would be to challenge them, and that doesn't work in this either. Maybe the images were challenging or interesting, but that isn't the right place for it. And then restored would be to take images that were pro like had problems with them. Maybe they were underdeveloped or they were old and uh, uncared for, what have you and return them to a new state. While any of those might have kind of made sense in the context of the idea of the passage, in this particular function, this particular portion of the passage, created is the only thing that sounds like made. And made is the word that we're looking for. So created, B, is what we got. So uh, five, we have another vocab question here on module two of SAT 394. As always, I do not want us just taking our answer choices and throwing them in to the missing underlined portion. I want us thinking of what kind of language do we want there? Okay. So in addition to being an accomplished psychologist himself, Francis Cecil Summer was some had some relationship with increasing the opportunity for black students to study psychology. Helping to found the psycholo psychology department at Howard University, a historically black university in 1930. Okay, so it sounds like he was an advocate of increasing the opportunity, right? Or instrumental to increasing the opportunity. He looks like he promoted and sought that. Okay, so we're looking for something that sounds like that. Advocate worked to increase, right? But of course, we can't choose advocate because advocate would need it was an, right? So proponent does not mean opponent, 
Okay, think about the difference. Opposite means to go away, right? An opponent of something is to stand against something. But proponent, in the same way that pro means for, means to be for something. So if you're a proponent, it's the same way that you can maybe, you know, be uh, like pro in other regards, right? Where you're advocating for it. That's what you want. That's what you agree for. So as a proponent of increasing the opportunity, he is an advocate of increasing for the opportunity. He wants to do it. He's helping it. A supplement to increasing it would mean that he is a supplement. Um that he is kind of supporting it in a supplementary, complementary role, which isn't the case here, okay? Weird to suggest that people are a supplement in general, um, not just because it kind of sounds like you're saying that they're like a protein shake, but for other reasons too. A beneficiary of increasing the opportunity. Now, that part is the one that I can understand being a really good distractor because we understand that he is a psychologist and you know, that maybe he would be a beneficiary of increasing the opportunity. However, he founded this thing, right? So he must have already, he, he's not benefiting from this psychology department when he's already a psychologist, if he's helping to found it, okay? He is helping to create opportunity. He isn't benefiting from it in a direct sense. And then distraction four doesn't really fit here whatsoever, to distract for uh, increasing it, a distraction for it. I, I don't really see how that could fit. So if you're missing this question, we maybe don't understand the word proponent, in which case I would really advocate for you to write me a proponent of you using the 90-10 rule to think, okay, opponent, I know what that word is. Proponent, that pro, hmm, I kind of know what that prefix means. That means to be for something, right? Therefore, we can probably figure that word out with a little bit of time. And guess what? The digital SAT gives you plenty of time. So take that time and probably get this answer choice, uh, getting this question correct with your next attempt. Okay, so six is probably the most difficult vocab question of either module. As always, we wanna find a word that fits there. But in this case, a lot of the words that we are offered we don't maybe know the, 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 the meaning of, and we do need to know that. If you're missing a question like this, I'm really just gonna advocate, increase your vocabulary. Study the vocabulary lists, play the vocabulary games, use the vocabulary flashcards. All the things that we are providing for you, you should probably use. Because these are all words that are relatively straightforward, yet maybe uncommon for you. So, um, whether the reign of a French monarch such as Hugh Capet or Henry I was historically consequential or relatively uneventful, its trajectory was shaped by questions of legitimacy and therefore cannot be understood without a corollary understanding of the factors that allowed the monarchy to blank his right to hold the throne, okay? We're looking for a word like support, okay? To support his right or, yeah, really that's the only word I could think of that would fit there, right? Um, because the monarchy, or the monarch is, you know, straight or strengthen his right to hold the throne. The monarch is saying, look, you don't think I should be king, but I should be king. And that is going to be the whole objective of that monarch's time as a ruler. You might not be able to, you know, lead a very successful crusade if you leave home and someone else, your brother or your uncle is going to say, ah, I should be king. Okay. So reciprocate means to give back in a to, in a return form, okay? So reciprocity or to reciprocate something is if I were to, you know, give someone a gift, they would give a gift back to me about a week later. It's to give what you get, okay? Um, reciprocate his right doesn't really make any sense. It's not a... Uh, his right is not something that was given and he's giving it back. It, it doesn't really make sense. Annotate, we understand to mean, because you're in a class like this, underlining or scoring or whatever things, right? So to annotate something is to mark it up. Doesn't make sense here. Buttress, for all of my, you know, my many um, architecture students here, buttress, you would know, is a thing 
that supports a building. If you took AP art history or AP world history, you know about buttresses and the importance that they had in supporting the building of these grand cathedrals in Europe or these large megaplexes in the past anywhere around the world. Buttresses are support. Buttress means support. That's the word we were looking for, right? When we were looking for that pink word. Disengage means to disengage, right? To break away and stop engaging. Dis, the prefix, means to stop and engage. We know what engage means. So doesn't really fit there. Buttress is the only one that fits. And that brings us to an end of our vocabulary questions for this second module of 394. Okay, so looking at question seven here, we have another reading question here on module two of test 394. This question in particular is one of our function and main idea and detail type questions. We wanna know the function of the underlined sentence. So first things first, questions like these, if you're missing questions like these, remember that we need to know the whole context to understand the function of the underlined sentence. Yeah, we're looking at the underlined sentence, but if you're not thinking of its function as a whole, you're not going to understand the function generally, okay? Think about the idea of like looking at a zipper, right? If you don't know if the zipper is for jeans or for, you know, a half zip or what have you, you're not going to really understand what the zipper, how the zipper should be, okay? So looking at this question, some bird species don't raise their own chicks. Instead, adult females lay their eggs in other nests next to another bird species own eggs. Female cuckoos have been seen, or maybe cuckoos, have been seen quickly laying eggs in the nests of other bird species when those birds are out foraging for food, looking for food. After the eggs hatch, the non-cuckoo parents will typically raise the cuckoo chicks as if they were their own offspring, even if the cuckoos look very different from the other chicks. So what is this whole passage saying? That there are some bird species that don't raise their own eggs. And here is an example of that situation. Um, cuckoos are an example. Uh, the underlying portion describes how they, it's, it, 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 it describes how this is an example of the first claim, right? It exemplifies the first claim. So um, it describes a physical feature of female cuckoos that is described later in the text? No, because we don't get a physical feature of female cuckoos. So that word physical is really important. A feature of female cuckoos that is described later in the text would be fine, probably. But that physical there is wrong. B, it describes the appearance of the cuckoo nests mentioned earlier in the text. Now one, cuckoo nests are not mentioned earlier in the text. Uh, they don't have their own nests. And it, that isn't what this describes, so that doesn't make any sense. C, it offers a detail about how female cuckoos carry out the behavior discussed in the text. Okay, so what is the behavior? Laying eggs in other nests. What is this? An example of that, right? So that is looking pretty good so far. I'm liking C, but let's just see about D. D, it explains how other birds react to the female cuckoo's behavior discussed in the text. Okay, no, because we don't have the other birds visible. They're not being discussed here. Now they're discussed in the next sentence, but that isn't even in relation to female cuckoo behavior, really. So the only answer that has nothing wrong with it is C. Okay, so question eight here, we have a detail question as shown by this, according to the text. And anytime we see a question with that a little key word, according to the text, we know that our answer choice is going to have to be pulled from the text itself. Maybe not verbatim or word for word, but similar. Okay, so cats can judge unseen people's positions in space by the sound of their voices and thus react with surprise when the same person calls to them from two different locations in a short span of time. Seho Takagi and colleagues reached this conclusion by measuring cats' levels of surprise based on their ear and head movements, while the cats heard recordings of their owners' voices from two speakers placed, spaced far apart. Cats exhibited a low level of surprise when owners' voices were played twice from the same speaker, but they showed a high level of surprise when the voice was placed 
once each, when the voice was played, once each from the two different speakers. So, how did the researchers determine the level of surprise? Well, they determined it by looking at ear and head movements of the cats while listening to the recordings. So, ear and head movements is what we're looking for. And right away with answer choice A, we see ear and head movements, right? It is verbatim from the text. That is what we're generally looking for. So I'm liking A right from the get-go. But let's make sure that we find something wrong with all these other ones. They examine how each cat reacted to the voice of a stranger. Okay, so first off, we know that the, vo the voice that they're responding to is their owners. So that's wrong. Stranger and owners. C, they studied how each cat physically interacted. Okay, that sounds good, 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 good. But then owner. They're not interacting with their owner. It's how they res physically respond to the voice of their owner. And then finally, they tracked how each cat moved. That's all good until we get to around the room. We want to see how they moved their ears and their head. Okay, so all of these other answer choices are wrong on the basis of being half right. Okay, um, part of it is right, but part of it is wrong. We want to be on the lookout for that, especially in other instances when our correct answer choice isn't the first one to show up, which is typical, right? If A were D, it would be hard to wade through the waters of these other three uh, answer choices before getting to the correct one. So make sure you're staying rigorous, methodical, and looking to get rid of answer choices, especially with these detailed questions where we're pulling directly from the text. Okay, so we're working on question nine here of module two, 394. I already highlighted some important things here. We are asked for a logical inference question based on the evidence of this passage. Most importantly, we are looking to find what would most directly weaken a student's hypothesis. So what does that mean we need to know? We need to know the student's hypothesis really clearly, and we need to know what would be the inverse of that hypothesis. Okay, so um, looking at this from the start, we see that the student's hypothesis is that a slightly acidic soil is more beneficial for the growth of a plant, brassica, or sometimes called choice sum, than a neutral soil environment. Of course, brassicas are a whole bunch of different things. So what was her experiment? She put some choice sum in a highly acidic soil, um, or slightly acidic soil, so it's a mix of highly acidic and normal soil. And then another 16 seeds as the control in a soil that was not made more acidic. They were both exposed to the same growing conditions and monitored for three weeks. So to support the student's hypothesis, we would want to see the choice sum in the coffee grounds growing bigger. But we're looking for the opposite, right? We want to weaken the student's hypothesis. So we want to see that the choice sum grown in the soil without coffee grounds is either equal or better, okay? So it can be equal or better to weaken the student's hypothesis. So looking at our first one, the choice sum planted in the soil without coffee grounds were significantly taller than them than this choice sum planted in the mixture of soil and coffee grounds. It's immediately what we're looking for, right? We wanted to see the opposite of what we would expect for this hypothesis. So that's really good, but let's make sure that there's something wrong in everything else so that our, we're not allowing our eyes to deceive us. B, the choice sum grown in the soil without coffee grounds weighed significantly less than what was grown in the acidic soil. That's what not what we're looking for. That supports the student's hypothesis. That is why this word weaken is the most important word in here. Okay, It's easy to choose B if you're looking to support the hypothesis, which is the opposite of what you should be doing. C. Okay, so germination rate is not what we're looking for, okay? Um, additionally, even if, the, if we could infer that sprouting later results in uh, worse growth, it's in the wrong group, right? We want to see the group without coffee grounds doing better or equal to the group with coffee grounds. Finally, D, um, we have... Again, the wrong circumstance and the opposite comparison. So we are going to have to go with A. Okay, so for question 10 here, we are 
working from a short story, we are being asked to illustrate a claim made about the passage. So what do we hear about the passage? We hear that there is a 17 year old girl and her younger brother out for a meal and describing the teenager. Okay, so the teenager. Uh, Mansfield frequently contrasts the character's pleasant appearance with her. Okay, so we know that the teenager is the 17 year old girl now. Unpleasant attitude, as when Manfield writes something. So we want to see an answer choice which shows pleasant appearance and unpleasant attitude. So, one, I heard a murmur. I can't bear flowers on a table. They had evidently been given, giving her intense pain, for she positively closed her eyes as she moved away from them. Okay, I don't see, you know, maybe this is... Uh, unpleasant attitude, perhaps, but I don't see anything about physical appearance, so we can get rid of A. B, while we waited, she took out a little gold powder box with a mirror in the lid, shook the poor little puff as though she loathed it. Okay, loathing is unpleasant attitude, and dabbed her lovely nose. So she's pretty, her nose at the very least, but she loathes doing the thing, I think that might be okay. Let's see if there's worse stuff. We can get rid of everything else, then B is probably good. I saw after that she could no longer stand that she couldn't stand this place a moment longer. And indeed, she jumped up and turned away when I went through the vulgar act of paying for the tea. All right. So the girl is acting very unpleasant here. Everything unpleasant, but do we get to see a pleasant appearance? No. And D does the same thing. We don't see her appearance. We see her wince and bite her lip, but her, so her attitude is certainly unpleasant, but her appearance doesn't describe as pleasant. So this is the only one which has both parameters, therefore B. Okay, so for question 11 here, we are working with a uh, command of evidence quantitative question. So we are gonna be comparing data from our figure or graph along with data from our reading. So high levels of public uncertainty about which economic policies a country will adopt can make planning difficult for businesses. But the measures of such uncertainty have not tended to be very detailed. Recently, however, economist Sandil Klaswahio analyzed trends and news reports to derive measures not only for general economic policy uncertainty, but also for uncertainty related to specific areas of economic policy like trade or tax policy. One revelation of her work is that a general measure may not fully reflect uncertainty about specific areas of the policy. As is the case, as in the case of the United Kingdom, or general economic policy uncertainty. Okay, so what we wanna see is that there's a difference between general economic policy uncertainty, okay, so the black one being there, and a big difference between that and other policy uncertainty. Okay, so these are in alignment here, probably. But um, we want to see if there are differences elsewhere. So 2005, we see there is really high trade uncertainty, but low general economic uncertainty. Meanwhile, there was little uncertainty about trade policy in 2010, but high uncertainty about general economic policy in 2010. Um, also, there was really high uncertainty here and relatively low or here. I'm looking at the difference between trade here. It seems like trade uncertainty, pol trade policy uncertainty doesn't have as big of an impact on economic policy uncertainty in general. So let's find something that shows that. A, it aligned closely with uncertainty. So what about the graph? We wanna say that general economic policy aligned closely with uncertainty about tax and public spending, but differed in, so in 2005 it was the same and in 2009 it was different. Okay, if that were true, that would be great. But was there a close alignment in uncertainty about tax and public spending uh, and general in 2005 um and then no okay 
These are the same here, relatively different here, but in particular, the 2009 one is wrong. So while this could be a sensible take, the data shows that it's wrong. B, general uncertainty was substantially lower than uncertainty about tax and public policy spending each year from 2005 to 2010. No, we can see that's wrong because of years like 2007, where it is higher uncertainty. Um, and also 2006. Uh, C, it reached its highest level between 2005 and 2010 in the same year that uncertainty about trade policy and tax and public spending levels reached their lowest levels. That would mean that the black is really high while the other two are really low. And looking at this, I don't see that anywhere. There's no instance where the black bar is really high and the two gray ones are really low. So we've already gotten rid of all of them except for the correct answer, which would be D, but let's see if D is true. We see that uh, here, big difference, there was high trade uncertainty and low general uncertainty comparatively. But meanwhile, in 2010, there was high general uncertainty and low trade uncertainty. So therefore, yes, that shows that uh, the claim of sand deal is relatively true, which is that economic uncertainty in the general sense isn't a great indicator of how people feel in specific senses. All right, so for question here, uh, for question 12 here on module two of 394, we are asked a classic command of evidence question. So which finding would most strongly support Tannen's hypothesis? So first thing we need to make sure we understand Tannen's hypothesis. So framing contentious, contentious issues in terms of two highly competitive perspectives is cautioned against. Why? Because debate given approaches can strip issues of their complexity and can be less informative than just presenting multiple perspectives in a non-competitive format. So according to Tannen, if you see, just simply put, information from multiple perspectives in a non-competitive format, you're gonna learn more than if you see it in a highly competitive uh, debate-like situation. You're not learning in that case, you're evaluating something else. So, to test the hypothesis, we get the method, which is a study in which they show um, three different versions of local news commentary about the same issue. Each version featured a debate between um, a little bit weirdly worded. Each version featured a debate between two commentators with opposing views, a panel of three commentators with various views, or a single commentator. So <clears throat> we want to find something that says the people watching the panel with various views rather than the single commentator or the debate will get the most information out of it, or will demonstrate the most information. So C says that pretty clearly. Um, those who watch the panel have more correct answers um, about the issue than those who watch the debate or the single commentator. That means they're seeing it in the least contentious way and they're getting the most information. Um, this B answer is a pretty good distractor, but it's giving us the wrong result, right? So it says that the commentators is good or better. So that's a good thing, but we're not looking for the commentators being more knowledgeable or perceiving them more knowledgeable. It's about, are the people who are watching this coming out of it more knowledgeable? Um, A again is on the wrong parameter, focusing on the people participating, looking more knowledgeable rather than the person watching being knowledgeable. And then finally, D is incorrect, even though this is good, 
we want to see something like this, right? More than the debate is good. This part, the single commentator part is also irrelevant. So therefore we're going to go with C. Um, <laughs> I will say that's a little confusing, um, but whatever. Okay, so question 13 here is one of the more confusing or difficult question types on the test and also one of the more difficult questions in general. Um, we are looking for a quotation to, uh, I wanna use blue there, or actually a highlighter. A quotation from the King Lear to illustrate the claim. So what is the claim? Regret for his actions. All right, so you do not have to have read King Lear, and I'm going to assume that you haven't for this. So we want to show something of regret, all right, uh, where he is regretting his actions. A is the opposite, okay? I'm a man more sinned against than sinning. That's not regretting his actions. That's regretting the actions of others towards him. He is saying people do things against me or make problems for me far more often than I do something bad. B is said to say that this storm will not give me time to think about things that would hurt me more than the storm itself. Okay, this is mainly saying like something kind of irrelevant to regret. Um, this isn't him expressing regret. This is maybe him saying, I don't even have time to regret, thank God. If you chose this, you're probably reading too interpretively for an SAT. Could we maybe in an English class infer that not being able to think about the rest of things demonstrates that perhaps he has regrets? Yeah, I think you could probably make that argument in an English class. But the SAT is not that. We always want to be safe with our inferences. We don't want to get too interpretive. We don't want to go too far. C, he says to himself while striking his head, okay, striking his head, he's going like, oh, oh, stupid, stupid, okay, um, which is crazy. Uh, but he's striking his head saying, beat at this gate that let thy folly out, All right? So he's saying, curse my brain, curse my head that let my folly, or like, mistaken, stupid, silly stupidity out, uh, or let let your folly in rather, so stu stupidity into the brain and judgment out. Okay, so his judgment is left, his stupidity has gone in, he's hitting himself in the head saying, I'm so stupid, why did I give up judgment and just commit to some stupid idea, some folly? So that's compelling to me. Let's see if D more explicitly refers to regret. D says, I will do such things, what they are yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. This is of actions that will come in this point of the play. We don't know what those actions are. We don't know what is influencing those actions. If you have read King Lear, you have to drop the idea of knowing King Lear here and work solely from what we are given. And by what we are given, there's only one thing that ex expresses regret or demonstrates regret, a sort of frustration with the self that regret is. All the rest of these, some of them could implicitly refer to things that are regret or be actions that come out as, as a consequence of regret. We could maybe perceive that, but it is not made explicitly clear. Do not fall for baggage or bring in your own baggage of knowing King Lear to lead you to an answer choice that doesn't go based off the text of the SAT. So question 14 has a lot of answer choices that are compelling distractors based off of being maybe true or plausible, but irrelevant to the question. So we are asked to logically complete the text. To logically complete the text, we need to work from consequently. Right, so we are given the idea that Shakespeare's tragedies are 
appealing or relevant till today because they have broad universal themes. But that's important. So while those are relevant to today, however, understanding history plays requires knowledge of several centuries of English history. Consequently, or therefore, we are looking for something that kind of finishes this logical comparison, which is to say, while these plays are relevant still, these other plays are not relevant. While those plays had universal themes, these plays have very specific themes, which makes them maybe not relevant or feel less relevant. So A says less relevant than the things that are more relevant with readers and theaters today. Okay, that's exactly what we're looking for. But let's find what's wrong with these other ones. So B, some of Shakespeare's tragedies are more relevant to today's audiences than 20th century plays. All right, this is an interesting one because that can certainly be true. Right? That certainly could be true. But why do we not like it? Well, one, we don't learn anything about 20th century plays in here. We're not given any relevant, they're irrelevant to the text. And finally, they don't really give anything, you know, it while it may be true, it's irrelevant or unrelated to what we are looking to answer. C. Romeo and Juliet is the most thematically accessible of all of Shakespeare's tragedies. That might be an opinion that you agree with, but is that supported by the text? No. Additionally, does the text say that it is the most at any point? No, it doesn't. Most is a superlative. It is an extreme answer. It means that no other play is as accessible thematically. Perhaps that is true. Perhaps it isn't, but it isn't supported by the text. Therefore, we have to ignore it. And then finally, D, is it possible or plausible that experts in English history would prefer history plays? Yeah, but is there anything supporting that in the text? No. Experts in English history is not a topic or a subject in the passage, right? So even though it says absolutely that the Shakespeare history plays require knowledge of several centuries of English history, why would we know as a guarantee that English historians prefer these plays because it deals with their field of it, uh, their field of expertise? There's nothing that says that, right? Um, football players might not like football movies more than any other other movie. Okay, um, they might too, but unless it is said that they did a study that shows that, we can't roll with it. So there's nothing wrong with a. Simply put, there is nothing wrong with A. It is a logical inference based off of the logical comparison of tragedies are universal, are universal themes and therefore relevant today, but history plays have specific themes and are therefore less universally relevant. Okay, so for 15, logically completing the text, we want to infer something that is logical to the argument of the text. So the argument of the text is that though the ancestral Puebloan civilization dispersed suddenly, abandoning established villages with systems for farming crops and importantly, turkeys, um, recent analysis, uh, okay, sorry, a little bit. So though they abandoned their common their places and dispersed elsewhere, they became the modern day Pueblo tribes. Some evidence for this is that looking at Turkey remains at Mesa Verde, which is one of the ancestral Puebloan villages shows that there is a genetic, comparable genetic thing between the two. So we want to say that as on the basis of this comparable genetic markers, the turkeys that we see at later or current Pueblo tribe sites are related and descended from the turkeys at ancestral 
Pueblo insights. So what shows that would be here? Okay, now, this is one of those ones that's a little bit interesting where B isn't entirely irrefutable. Normally we want an answer choice that's entirely irrefutable, but is it a guarantee that the ancestral Puebloans migrated to that valley and carried the turkeys with them? Um, we know for a fact that the turkeys got there. We don't know for a fact that the ancestral Puebloans themselves went there. Uh, could have been that the turkeys were stolen. Maybe they were conquered or something like that. Who knows? However, while this might not be logically irrefutable, it is logically supported. Let's see if there's anything else that can be supported. This one had greater similarities in the past than they do today. How would we know that, right? Are we talking about terrain or anything like that? Um, that could possibly be a baggage distractor, right? An answer that we are leaning towards because we know the past or we know our other answer choice or we, we know the, the topic discussed here. If that's happening, you're likely, you know, maybe know a lot about Mesa Verde, maybe you visited there at some point on a road trip and you know that they say the environment has changed, but we don't want to bring our knowledge into this. Everything we no need to know about this passage and this question are in this passage. That's all we need. C, did not cultivate turkeys before 1280. Well, for one, the Rio Grande Valley primarily planted crops where is that supported anywhere? Okay. And then D, ancestral Puebloans of Mesa Verde likely adopted farming practices of indigenous peoples living in other regions. Okay, this one is a basically a mirror distractor. If this was flipped, then it said something more along the lines of people, Pueblo peoples in the Rio Grande Valley likely adopted farming practices of indigenous people living in other regions. That would be hard to get rid of. But because of the timeline thing where the ancestral Puebloans come first and then other people at the Rio Grande Valley come later, it doesn't work. So while B is not necessarily irrefutable, the rest of these are refutable. And because we are looking to get rid of answer choices first, we can arrive at B and be confident with our answer. Okay, so um, question 16 is another logical completion question, just like 15 and others. Um, so we want to make sure that we are logically completing the text. What is the text about? Well, it's basically saying there isn't a good way of controlling this study. The study is uh, examining whether becoming an elected official changes a person's behavior, right? So does it have an appropriate control group? It's difficult to find. Um, why? Well, um, you need to compare people who had elected office with people who do not hold elective office, but are otherwise similar to office holders. So how do we find that similarity? So we're looking for something that showcases that it is difficult to identify a group that would be a good control. D does that exactly. It says it's hard to find a group that can function as a control group. Um, <clears throat> a, it is not a struggle to find data um, because we are not comparing politicians before they hold office to after they hold office. Um, we are trying to do a control group that are different people. We need to compare it to different people. Um, B is perhaps plausible, but doesn't continue this sentence. And C, this is a no good distractor, very opposite, because we want something that's, we want a group of people who are very similar rather than people who are very different. So that all being said, D is the only answer which we can't go with because there's nothing wrong with it, though there is something wrong with A, B, and C. So for question 17, we have a punctuation question uh, that's asking about whether something is possessive or plural, making sure that we're keeping that straight across the whole 
uh, portion that's underlined. So in his groundbreaking book, Bengali Harlem and the Lost Histories of the South Asian America, Vivek Bald uses newspaper articles, census records, ships logs, and memoirs to tell the blank of the South Asian immigrants who the stories of the South Asian immigrants who made New York City their home in the early 20th century. So first things first, is stories possessive or going to just be plural? So the way that we know is this, of the South Asian, okay? So because that is there, we know that we do not need to make stories possessive because it already is possessive, right? And whenever you see that, so, you know, an of the, a blank of the blank, it's already in its possessive form um, that is possessive. So we don't need any answer choice that makes our first stories possessive. So that means we can already be at C, but I want to point something out with D. So D, plural possessive. If this was switched, South Asian immigrants' stories, right? If it were in that case, D would be best. But because this comes after with the of the, that means that this apostrophe in D is obsolete or irrelevant. It's too much. So finally, one thing to consider as well is immigrants, 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 immigrants. Is immigrants just simply plural like it is in those two? Yes, it is not. Uh, immigrants does not need to be possessive. So C is the only one that works. Okay, so for question 18, we have a punctuation question here. It's ultimately a question about lists. So lists, if they are not coming after a sentence that stands on its own, they just are, they just show up, right? We just put them in the sentence normally. We don't need punctuation to separate a list from the rest of the sentence. Okay, now you may have heard, ah, well, I know that we can start lists with colons or a dash. That's true, you can. When do we do that though is specific or when we do that as a specific context. When do we use a colon or a dash to start a list? If it's coming after a fully resolved independent clause or a fully resolved sentence basically, okay? It needs to finish. Um, in that case, the list is an elaboration, all right? But in this case, the list is not an elaboration. Painter Howard Dina Pindle explored themes of healing, self-discovery, and memory by cutting and sewing back together, blah, 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 okay? So it's just the beginning of a list. We don't need any punctuation. A is all we need. Of suggests that, with the comma, suggests that of is a part of the list. C, again, an elaboration means everything before it must be able to stand on its own as a sentence. And in her two major series, Painter Howard Dina Pindle explored themes of, it's not a sentence. You can't end it. Of D is the same error. Therefore, we are going to go with A. So question 19, we have another punctuation question. This is asking about non-essential phrases. So when we have non-essential phrases, right? A, a piece of a phrase, a piece of a sentence that is helpful, but that isn't necessary for the sentence to function as a sentence, meaning the sentence stands as an independent clause without that phrase, we have three options. We can put it within a pair of commas, a pair of parentheses, or a pair of dashes. So in this case, we wanna make sure that we are not beginning and ending our non-essential phrase with different punctuation. And we wanna make sure that we begin it and close it in general. So. Our non-essential phrase is beginning with a comma. Therefore, our non-essential phrase must end with a comma. So A, so B has no comma anywhere, so we can get rid of B. Now we have to think, where does the non-essential phrase end? It ends after the full carbon 13 in parentheses 13C. So that parentheses is another non-essential phrase. All right. So we need to have both of them within the pair of commas. So 
because A ends with the parenthesis, we can't go. Now, the question is, do we need a comma or not to separate carbon-13 and 13C? No, we do not. Why? Well, we want to make sure that we're showing that the non-essential phrase ends here rather than begins there. And 13C is an elaborate or is a non-essential phrase explaining what carbon-13 is. You put them right next to each other. So D has the correct answer because it's two non-essential phrases embedded within one non-essential phrase. And we are creating it by starting it with a comma, then having C13 in parentheses and ending with a comma. Whatever you start with, you must finish with. So 20 is asking about verb tense. What may be confusing for a sentence like this is the presence of non-essential phrases. So we don't know exactly what we are conjugating our verb to. So this here, we can ignore, right? Because it is a non-essential phrase. So what are we really considering? Emmanuel Carpentier and Jennifer Duna recreated and then programmed the so-called genetic scissors of a species of DNA cleaving bacteria. So we can even ignore this. Well, not all of it. What we really want to focus on is this here. Recreated and programmed the genetic Caesars to do something, okay? So we're just going to use the infinitive. They recreated and then reprogrammed genetic scissors to forge a tool, okay? So in red is stuff that we don't need. To consider in order to consider our conjugation. So forging could work if there was a comma, but there isn't. Forge would work if recreated and then reprogrammed wasn't there, but we are describing what they recreated and reprogrammed genetic scissors to do. So we're conjugating again, conjugating again to genetic scissors. And forging would be if this was part of a list of recreating, programming, and forging. However, those both are in the past tense for one. So even if that was part of that same list, he would be wrong. But additionally, we're conjugating our verb to genetic scissors and therefore must be to fork. Okay, so there are a couple different questions being asked on 21. So 21 is asking about modifier placement. We want to make sure that we have a proper connection between the subject of our sentence and what we're talking about. So looking at the sentence, or looking at the passage, we see that we are talking about bioswales, which are designed to absorb and direct stormwater, right? Divert stormwater. So an engineer made bioswales do something. So by reducing the runoff flowing into city sewers, something happened. Well, we want to make sure that bioswales is the next word there. What are the bioswales doing? Because that is the subject. Okay, so as a result, the mitigation. So by reducing the runoff flowing into city sewers, the mitigation suggests that the mitigation is fl reducing the runoff flowing into city sewers. All right, why is that wrong? Well, the mitigation is a consequence of the bioswales and it's not the thing itself. Okay. So an answer choice like A, our brain can make sense of it. That's why questions like this are difficult. An answer choice like A is something we can understand and make logical, but it isn't inherently logical, all right? D does the same thing. Um, it puts a, it, it, it doesn't have our subject in the right place, right? So both B and C are good so far because they both have bioswales coming next. By reducing the runoff flowing into city sewers, bioswales do something. Now, um, bioswales mitigation has been achieved versus the bioswales have mitigated. One, we like B because we are always looking for precision and concision. Concision being shorter, precise being proper. Okay. B is much more concise than C while saying the same thing. Now, why could a longer answer choice be better than a shorter answer choice? Well, if the shorter answer choice doesn't say the same thing, for one, or for two, it creates an error. 
So where could there be an error? It would be in the verb, in in and how where the tense is. So the bioswales have mitigated. Okay, that means that they have started the mitigation process. It's made it better, right? They've made street flooding and pollution better. They've they've reduced it. Okay, so that is good, right? If it said the bio, bio swales, um had mitigated both street flooding and the resulting pollution, we would have an issue here, right? Because this is something that was instituted, but continues to be instituted, continues to create this good situation. Um, so that's the only way that a shorter answer could be worse than a longer answer choice, if they're saying the same thing, is if the shorter answer choice says something actually different or says something wrong. So the precision is all good on B and the concision favors B. So B is better than C on those parameters. And both B and C are better than A and D because the subject is in the right spot. And actually, let me clarify. C, the subject is actually wrong because C, the subject isn't bioswales. C, the subject is the bioswales mitigation, right? So the bioswales mitigation is not actually the subject. The bioswales are. So actually, B is the only one, even though it is also concise, that isn't the most important parameter here. B is best because it is the only answer choice with the parameter of having bioswales as the subject, which is what we need in this case. Okay, so for 22, we have a punctuation question asking about elaborations, okay? So um, we talked a little bit earlier on question 18 about the idea of lists. So we probably have heard that lists can be begun with a colon. But when can lists be begun with a colon? Well, in a very specific circumstance. It's not every list should begin with a colon. It is lists that come at the end of an independent clause, at the end of a sentence, basically, that are tacked on to the end of a sentence as an elaboration that can be begun with commas. So if the list is an elaboration tacked on to the end of something that could be a sentence, we need to start it with a colon. Otherwise, it can just come up. So our first thing is to determine what is before continent. So a study published, we have a subject and a predicate already, by Rice, university geoscientist, offers, actually offers might be the predicate, a new explanation for the origin of Earth's continents. Okay, that's a sentence, or it could be a sentence. Now, we could put a period or a semicolon there if everything that came after continents also could be a sentence. However, we see that we are just describing this word continents. We only have a phrase coming after it. So, we have a list. Structures called arcs, towering ridges, melt into the mantle, and then rise and burst. Um, so they subduct, they melt, they rise, and they burst. We have an elaboration here. We are explaining what continence is. When we have an elaboration, we use a colon or a dash. In this case, we have a colon as an option. C and D, as a little trick, you can see do the exact same thing. There's no difference in the way that C or D function. You'll never be asked to choose between a semicolon or a period, all everything, all other factors being exactly the same. Why? Because both a semicolon and a period separate two independent clauses, and that's their role, right? So um, uh, unless a semicolon is being used in a different form, which it could be if we're creating lists which need a comma in the elements of the list. That, in that case, you separate the elements of the list with semicolons. So barring something like that, if, C and, if, if semicolons and periods are both being used to separate uh, non-essential phrases, you could not choose between the two. Uh, but we have an elaboration here, so we go with the colon. So for 23, we have a transitions question. Uh, we want to make sure that our our strategy for transitions isn't just taking our answer choices and plugging them in and seeing which one sounds nicest to us. Um, if you did that on this answer or on this question, you got it wrong. There's likely the case that 
you thought most of them sounded nice and you just went with one that you thought was more interesting or more sophisticated sounding. But what really we want to do is figure out what is the role of the transition? What is it transitioning between? What kind of uh, category of transition or meaning is it supposed to convey? So here we say, during this, something happened. After this, something else happened, right? We have a time-oriented transition. So we could use next or after or later or something like that. Additionally, it doesn't work because it's that requires us to be building on top of what came before. And to add, right? Um, maybe in a recipe, right? Additionally, uh, you know, we'll want this or that, okay? Indeed provides emphasis, okay? So we would use indeed in a situation in which we are kind of providing emphasis through an example or something like that, right? So, um, you know, test prep is important. Uh, indeed, studies show that performing well on tests increases your chances of getting into college. Similarly is something which is similar, okay? So in Europe, uh, forests have been clear cut. Similarly, the forests of the Pacific Northwest were also clear cut, okay? So afterward is the only one that gives us the context we're looking for, which is a time transition, something that moves us sequentially along. So for 24, if you missed this question, I have a hunch. My hunch is that you are taking answer choices and plugging them in and going with what you like the sound of. And I'll admit, many of the answer choices here sound really good. There's a reason why we don't like this strategy here. We don't want to just take answer choices and plug them in because our brain makes them make sense. Okay. However, what we want to be doing is seeing what role is this transition functioning to do, right? What, what is the function of this transition? And then find an answer choice which aligns with that function. So words like specifically or for example, for example is one that when you plug it in, it sounds really good. When soil becomes contaminated by toxic metals, it can be removed from the ground and disposed in a landfill. For example, contaminated soil can be detoxified via phytoremediation, okay? If you just read that, it sounds really good, but it has the wrong meaning. Why? Because of the rest of the context. When you see here, this is a different option for removing contamination from the soil, for decontaminating soil, okay? so. It is a different or alternate option. Alternatively is exactly the kind of meaning that we want to convey here. We want to say one way of doing this is just getting rid of the dirt in the ground and throwing it in the trash. Okay. However, we can also do something else with phytoremediation, which is using plants that can absorb high amounts of the metal, high toxicity, um, and then cut that off and let the plant remove it for us, okay? So all of these specifically, for example, those these two both are suggesting that this next portion explains or exemplifies the claim made in the first sentence. To our ears before the colon, that might sound okay, but the meaning is wrong. The meaning is wrong. So D, as a result, says that it's a consequence of, right? So the consequence of removing it into the landfill. That also could sound right. Um, it sounds right to our ears, but what we are looking for is to convey meaning. That is the whole point of language. And the only one which conveys the correct meaning, which is to say, while we could sometimes just remove soil to get rid of toxic metals, we also have the option to do something else, something else being an alternate. A is the only one that conveys that meaning. So for 26, we have a rhetoric synthesis question asking us to read some notes and say something about it. This question, unlike any other question type on the test, I want us looking at the question before we read the passage. So what do we need? Only the parameters they ask for us. We're not being asked to do anything else. So we want to introduce this book to an audience that is already familiar with the Atlantic Monthly. 
All right. So all we really need to do is introduce this book to somebody that knows the Atlantic Monthly. So we probably want to at least reference the Atlantic, Atlantic Monthly, but we don't need to give a big description. And we want to introduce Cal Catherine Halverson's book. So the Atlantic Monthly was first published in, 19, in 1857. So I don't think we need this whole thing. I think all we need is that. We don't need to talk about what it is. <laughs> Here we have this and this. So Juanita Harrison is not irrelevant. Honestly, I don't even know if we need this. All we really need to say is that historian Catherine Haverson published a book about the Atlantic Monthly autobiographies in the magazine. Okay, so we don't need to describe the, the Atlantic Monthly. So, A, we have pink right here. It describes the book, and we already know what the magazine is, so we don't need to explain it. That has everything that we need, nothing more than we need. B, describes the Atlantic Monthly, but we are missing the book, Catherine Haverson's book. C, who are we missing? Catherine Haverson. And D, we are missing Catherine Haverson's book. Okay, the only one that talks about the book is A. Therefore, our only answer choice that we can go with is A. Is D perhaps a more compelling summary of what seems relevant to the, the notes? Or perhaps something like that, perhaps, but A is the only one that does the parameters that the question is explicitly asking for from us. That is why these questions are tricky. They're asking you to ignore maybe your intuition and focus solely on what they really rigorously want. So 25, we have one of our rhetorical synthesis questions, one of our notes questions, we could call it. With these, we wanna make sure that we are keeping our parameters limited. Okay, we are not being asked to summarize the notes or convey the most important meaning of the notes, right? We want to, or, or prove anything, we want to just follow what we are being asked to focus on. So what are we asked to focus on? The influence theory to an audience unfamiliar with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, okay? These are the one question, unlike every other question on the test, what I want is reading the question before we read the passage. So we want to look at influence theory. So actually, I'm going to show our two parameters with two different colors of highlighter. We want to show influence theory, OK? And we want to show the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So we want to introduce who the Haudenosaunee are, and we want to introduce or explain influence theory. So Haudenosaunee are a 10,000 year old alliance of native nations, the Seneca, the Mohawk, etc. Okay, good. That, that's yellow. We need that. Um, and there is a centuries old law, the law of peace. We don't we need that uh more for the pink as well. It's kind of both. And then we have influence theory. Okay, this comes after the one where it's explained. What is the explanation of influence theory? The great law of police influence the U.S. Constitution. And this final one proves it, but it doesn't explain it, nor does it introduce the tribe. So we don't need that either, okay, or the Confederacy. So, A, we have, I mean, I guess you could say that that is the pink, but what is missing? The yellow. B, Again, uh, B doesn't have really anything. It doesn't explain the influence theory, nor does it explain or introduce the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. C, we have an explanation of the influence theory. And we have an explanation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. 
So we have the influence theory and we have the confederacy. And as a result, that means we have everything we need in C. And looking at D, we have the Haudenosaunee, but we don't really have influence theory. So therefore, the only answer choice which combines all the parameters we need is C. Okay, so final question on test 394. We have a rhetorical synthesis question, right? We only want to be focusing on the question first. This is the rarest of examples on the test where we look at the question before we read the passage. Why? Because we only want to look at the most important parameters. So the student wants to emphasize a similarity between the two ways a magnificent frigate bird acquires food. So there must be two ways they acquire food. That's what we're focusing on, the two ways. So I'm going to highlight here in, in yellow the two ways. Why? Only because we're going to want, you know, both ways. So I'm going to use yellow for one way and pink for another way. So the magnificent frigate bird is a species of seabird that feeds mainly on fish, tuna, squid, and other small sea animals. It is unique among seabirds in that it doesn't dive into the prey for water. Okay, one way it acquires food is by using its bill to snatch prey from the surface of the water. Okay, that is one way. The other way is it acquires food by taking it from weaker birds by force. So what is the similarity here between these two? I don't exactly know yet. Maybe the similarity is that it doesn't dive into the water. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll see. Another maybe is that, um, yeah, I mean, really the only similarity between these two is that it doesn't dive into the water. Okay. So we want an answer choice, which says the two ways that it gets food and that these are similar because it doesn't dive. So A is wrong. Why? Well, we have one of them. But what's missing? The other way. We don't have the other way of how it's done. B doesn't list either of the two ways, but what it does do is it says that there are two ways and they are similar because neither of them require diving into the water. So I'm going to note this one. I, I kind of like it, but there might be one which says, although there are two different ways, neither of them do this. Okay. So C, this shows a difference, right? So while we get the yellow, while we get kleptoparasitism, we don't explain how these are similar, we're explaining how they are different. And D, ah, this is the most interesting, this is bad, okay, this is hard. Why is it hard? Well, we get one way of doing it, and we get the other way of do it, doing it. But what's wrong here? Well, no, no explanation of similarity, right? So we're not showing any way that these are similar. So even though D has the two parameters we need, it doesn't have the analysis we need, only B does. Therefore, we go with B. And that finishes up our test 394.